All right, in the previous uh, nervous system sections, we've already gone over spinal cord anatomy, and I did a little bit on reflexes to show, you know, an example of how those nerves connect, you know, to go to and from the spinal cord out to structures in the body. So at this point, um, we're now zooming in a little bit closer on the anatomy of what actually constitutes a nerve. And so remember, a nerve in the peripheral nervous system is the same idea as a tract in the central nervous system. The idea is it's just a bundle of axons. So this entire bundle, um, this is from an actual uh, micrograph under a microscope. Um, the illustration is showing you um, each of these tiny little individual things that you see here, like it's hard to even see close enough here. Um, if we zoom in closer, um, you would see that every one of those tiny little circles is an individual axon, right? And here they're showing it as these lines. Um, each of these lines represents the axon of a different neuron. And um, I think the most important thing to take away here is a nerve is just a bundle of axons, but they're going to and from all sorts of different structures and they have different functions. So um, every individual axon has to either be sensory or motor, and it has to connect to a really specific structure. So some of these axons might be motor neurons that are going away from the spinal cord to synapse with the muscle. Um, some of them might be sensory neurons that are going into the spinal cord to you know, go up towards the brain, right? Pathways we talked about in the previous video. And so remember nerves, once you're outside the spinal cord, um, nerves are all mixed. They're a combination of sensory and motor. Um, there are some cranial nerves that are only one or the other, but for spinal nerves, once you get past the spinal cord, it's always a mix, tons of different nerves, and they're grouped together just based on what part of the body they go to, right? And so it's not about exact function, it's just about anatomical location now, right? And so um, a bit more on the anatomy. Um, individual neurons are bundled into these structures called fascicles, which are really just little bundles wrapped in some connective tissue. So um, there are layers of connective tissue around individual axons, right? That is, so that is endoneurium, right? That would be really zoomed in. We can't even really see that here. Um, there's perineurium that wraps around a fascicle. And then there's epineurium that wraps around the entire nerve. And so we're just packaging those axons into larger and larger and larger bundles until you get to an entire nerve. Okay. Now, um, as we're heading out to the body, right? So your, your spinal cord um, would be over here, right? This would be dorsal root, ventral roots coming off of these spinal layers. Um, once you go past the spinal nerve, you see that there's a bunch of crisscrossing and intermixing that goes on. So nerves don't come out in nice, perfect straight lines. They, they mix with each other, they blend. And the reason for that is um, you don't want all of a certain function to be bound up in a single spinal nerve. Okay? So if it worked that, you know, pretend one of the muscles in your shoulder, like a deltoid, um, that would be getting innervation from somewhere around here, um, spinal nerve C5, C6, C7. If we said that 100% of the motor neurons that connect to the deltoid, if they all ran through C5, that would mean that if you damage C5, the muscle would be completely paralyzed, right? And so um, the whole concept of a plexus is that we don't want that to happen. It's basically don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? We don't want to put all of our motor neurons to a muscle through a single spinal nerve. And so we mix it, we crisscross it, we send those motor neurons out of C5 and C6 and C7 maybe um, so that we get a combination. That way, if one of them gets damaged, the others can at least allow some movement by the muscle. All right. And these plexuses, there are three or four, depending on how you define them. Um, the cervical plexus is nerves coming out of your upper cervical vertebra, right? C1 through C4 and they are connecting to the skin and muscles around the neck and the shoulders, but also very important, the phrenic nerve uh, runs through the cervical plexus, that connects to the diaphragm, which is your major um, breathing muscle. And so this is really a critical example of why you wouldn't put the entire phrenic nerve to just one spinal nerve, right? We send it to four different ones um, to make sure that even if one of them gets damaged, we can still breathe, okay? All right, similar idea, the brachial plexus is connecting to the arm and the hand, right? Brachial, um, the term brachial just means arm. And so from about C5 to T1, 
Um, these guys are coming off. They would be extending down into the arm and hand. They're just not being drawn here. Um, but these are the roots originating off the spinal nerve. And then um, same concept, the lumbosacral plexus. Um, you can split them apart into separate lumbar and sacral, um, but they overlap in the middle. And so we're just going to summarize them as being from L1 to S4, right? L1, the first lumbar vertebra, um, all the way through S4 down in um, the sacrum. And those are innervating muscles around the hips, the legs, and the feet. Okay, so um, I talked a little bit about the motor side of things and you know how this would work with muscles. With skin, it's a bit more straightforward. So we can map the skin um, and its sensory receptors back to the spinal nerves um, using something called a dermatome. So a dermatome is really just a particular patch of skin that connects to a certain spinal nerve. So in this picture, you would say that all, right, all of this skin going down to um, these four, those are the feet, all the way up this lateral side of the hip, that's L5, right? This skin would be L4, this would be L3, L2, et cetera. And same thing for the upper body, right? We can map this down the torso, we can map it down the arm. So what you can use this for is to say, all right, if a patient comes in and they have um, you know, sort of numbness and loss of feeling on the skin of this particular part of the body, right? The thumb um, up the lateral side of the forearm, you say, oh, um, order an MRI of C6 because that is very likely where the damage is. Um, if they have symptoms that don't specifically match any of these dermatomes, then you say, well, it's probably not damage to a spinal nerve. It's probably damage to a peripheral nerve, like out actually in the arm or the hand. And so if the symptoms match anything on the map, we assume spinal nerve damage because that's where they connect. If the symptoms don't match anything on the map, we assume the damage is downstream somewhere further down the arm or the leg. All right. Okay, so that's a brief overview of what's going on with nerves coming out of the spinal cord. Um, the other set of peripheral nerves, so the ones that don't come off the spinal cord, are cranial nerves. Um, so this is a list of uh, cranial nerves. There are 12 of them. And um, for every one of them, we can ask a couple questions. Um, the name tells you a little bit something about its function. The modality asks, um, is it sensory, is it motor, or is it both? Right? Mix just means sensory and motor. And the association just tells you um, where in the brain, right, in the CNS it tracks to. And so the first couple of cranial nerves start off um, up at the cerebrum with the olfactory nerve. And they were numbered in order, so they go deeper and deeper, right, through the midbrain, through the pons, um, and then eventually, right, down to the medulla, base of the brain, right? The test is giving you an idea of their function. So as a quick overview, um, the, the coffee grounds test, there's nothing special about coffee grounds. It's just because the olfactory is the nerve that detects smell. And so it makes sense that we test coffee grounds because we need to give the patient something um, to see if their sense of smell is intact. And coffee grounds are easy to keep on a, a shelf in a doctor's office. Okay? And remember, when you're giving these tests, this is usually to someone who's had a stroke or been in a serious car accident. And so they haven't realized yet if they have their sense of smell or not. They're probably still trying to wrap their head around what happened. Okay, so olfactory is sensory only and is entirely smell. Um, optic means like optics, like oculars, vision. Optic is 100% vision. So this isn't moving the eye. It's not, um, you know, like tracking or anything like that. It's just straight up vision. So if you had damage to the optic nerve, um, it would cause loss of visual field and, and complete blindness if it was permanently lost. So we just give a standard vision test. All right. Um, oculomotor. Um, the name oculo and motor move the eye um, makes sense. And it goes along with cranial nerves four and six as well. So three, four, and six all move muscles of the eye. Um, the oculomotor nerves um, move four out of those six muscles. And the other two, the trochlear and the abdicens, move one of the others. And so it's kind of ridiculous, right? Why not just have one? Well, I don't know. That's not how the symptom or the system is set up. So this is all eye movement. Nothing to do directly with vision. Um, this is the, you know, hold the pen in front of a person's eye and move it back and forth and see if their eyeball can track it and follow it or not. Um, if not, then you know it must be damaged to one of these nerves 
And um, we're not going to go into that level of depth, but if you needed to know exactly which one, then you would test based on which muscle um, that nerve connects to. All right, so these are all motor nerves because um, they're straight up movement of the eye. There's no sensory component, right? The optic is doing all the visual sensation. All right, okay, trigeminal. Um, trigeminal gets its name because it has three major branches coming off of it. Right, it originates off the pons and it is mixed. Um, the motor part of this is chewing, so the muscles that make the jaw move up and down um, are controlled by the trigeminal. And then um, there's also some, and the majority of the skin on the face um, has, sends its sensory nerves through the trigeminal. That's the sensory part of it, so it's mixed. All right. Okay, the facial nerve also mixed. Um, the motor part of this is facial expressions, right? So if a person has facial nerve damage, they'll likely have parts of their face sagging, low muscle tone. This is obviously um, a, a huge indicator of a stroke is the most likely way this could happen, but it could be from external damage too. Um, the sensory part of it, since it's mixed, is uh, taste. The catch is it is difficult to test taste because there are actually three different nerves that have a taste component. The facial is the most important one, um, but it's difficult to do the testing because other parts of the, or other nerves compensate. All right, eight. Um, vestibulocochlear is the most formal name. It used to be called auditory, but we give it its name because the vestibulo part of this is the vestibular system, right? Like equilibrium, balance, semicircular canals. So the, the chair spin, um, I put this in here half jokingly, you likely wouldn't spin a patient and make them busy. Um, I'm just meaning that to say they'll probably have balance issues if there's damage, All right? And um, also um, hearing, that's the cochlear part. In the ear, the cochlea is the organ that detects sound waves. That's the hearing portion. They're both sensory stimuli, so this is a sensory nerve. Okay. All right, glossopharyngeal. Um, this is a mixed nerve that connects to, um, it is one of the other taste nerves. Um, and it also connects to muscles around the gag reflex. So you would have um, loss of taste on the posterior um, one third of the tongue for the taste side of things, which you can test specifically. You just have to drop like a single drop of something like bitter tasting on the back of the tongue and see if the person registers, right? Gag reflex, that is the motor part of it. The muscles that create the gag reflex are actually innervated by a combination of glossopharyngeal and vagus. Um, the vagus also connects to vocal cords, so you expect speech problems and not being able to produce a lot of sound or change your pitch if that was a problem. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to note on here, um, we'll talk about it later when I go through detailed pictures of this, but the vagus nerve is also a huge part of the autonomic nervous system and specifically um, the parasympathetic. So the vagus goes down past the neck and connects to almost every, really every digestive and cardiothoracic organ you've got. So intestines, stomach, liver, lungs, um, they all have connections to the vagus nerve. It's the only cranial nerve that goes down into the abdominal and thoracic cavity. So big part of regulating digestion and heart rate. Okay, um, and so that's mixed, right? It's getting sensory information from like the stomach being full, for example, or blood pressure being too high. And then it responds by um, you know, starting digestion or decreasing heart rate, whatever the case may be. Right. Okay, nerve 11, um, spinal accessory because it branches off very close to the spinal cord and it is a motor only nerve and its only function is to elevate the shoulders. Um, so muscles like the trapezius, that if you do a shoulder shrugging motion, that's what's lifting your shoulder up. So that's a motor only. And hypoglossal, um, hypo tells you under and glossal always means tongue. So the nerve enters under the tongue, and this is the motor portion of the tongue. So tongue movement. Um, if there's damage here, a person will have a really difficult time talking, um, and their speech will sound all muffled because they can't move their tongue um, to make specific consonants. All right. Okay, so all these cranial nerves, um, this is just showing you a diagram of where they branch off the brain. And notice they're roughly in order. We start with the olfactory nerve near the most anterior portion of the brain. And then you move down to cranial nerves three, four, five, six, et cetera, just based off of um, 
the order from anterior to posterior of where they um, exit the brain. And then they would leave the skull through foramina, right? Holes in the skull that let the nerve go out to connect to wherever they connect, skin or muscles or eyes or ears, as the structure may dictate. Um, the sensory side, right, is sending this information back in through all of these roots um, to whatever part of the brain that information needs to go to. All right, as always, hope this was helpful. Um, follow along in the playlist and subscribe so that you get all the videos in order. Um, it'll make a lot more sense that way.